It's uh, good to see you, and it's interesting how the WGS, Ian, set up the conversation uh, with the cryptocurrencies, because I, I have this kind of uh, philosophy, and I think you share it, uh, that there's a bigger game at hand here, because cryptocurrencies uh, offer a threat to the major currencies of the world. Uh, you see them trying to regulate this, the central banks uh, that Alex was talking about. But the dollar right now is based on gold, and it's based on oil. Uh, and is that part of the Cold War, would you say? Is it a, is it a fair uh, description to say that we should watch for the next five years how oil's priced and whether other assets like strategic minerals take such dominance in the energy transition, for example, and what are they priced at? Thanks very much, John, and, and thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me here. I think when you enter a Cold War, everything becomes part of the game. And certainly, uh, cryptocurrency will become, the dollar will be. Uh, <laughs> one of the codependencies between the US and China is, of course, that China holds $3 trillion of US reserves. Uh, without China, <laughs> the US would be in a real mess uh, and uh, on the reserve front. And as the US ramps up its debt to try and sustain the consumption, it's China that's supporting that. Uh, so how that unwinds and the relationship between it and if ch how China is able to diversify its reserves is absolutely central. And central to that is not only whether it's able to establish a bigger block in its own currency, but also, of course, what happens with central bank digital currencies. Are we in a Cold War, though? I don't want to be so uh, generalist about it, but this is quite extraordinary, even if you take a look at the, uh, the aerial vehicles have been shot down in the United States. There's not a clear description of what the heck's going on here. Uh, and it's not good if you have these two technology powerhouses, uh, the two global uh, military powers of today not getting along. You'd say that, and can we avoid it? Yeah, I think we're in the foothills of a Cold War. I think it can be avoided. I think it absolutely has to be avoided. Uh, the consequences would be devastating for the world. It would also mean that we cannot resolve any other global problem. It means we'll have another pandemic. It means we'll have escalating climate change. It'll mean a very fractious and dangerous world. Of course, it'll slow the world economy. Everyone will suffer from a new Cold War, and certainly global problems will fester uh, and get much larger. So we need to avoid it. Can we avoid it? Yes. It's not too late. But we're in a very, very dangerous moment. We're in by far the most dangerous moment since November 1989, the end of the last Cold War when the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, and this is going to require extreme wisdom. I never thought I would think this again in my lifetime, but I wish Kissinger was back in the White House. Um, someone who... Poor guy's has, 99. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's not too of, late, right, for he's him. He's still writing books. There's a lot of burden his, on his, uh, his brain. Henry Kissinger. His, his, no, he was able to understand the concept of frenemies. He was able to understand that the US and China had to get along. Hmm. And that was when China was tiny compared to what it is today in terms of its global significance in all respects. Uh, we just don't seem to have that appreciation of how serious uh, this could become and how we need to avoid the conflict. Okay, I'm sure you're watching uh, like I have, uh, how China handles Russia right now. And you can read between the tea leaves. They had, for example, that uh, Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization meeting, uh, and the translation uh, perhaps was misrepresented in the West. They weren't stern words from Xi Jinping, uh, but President Putin acknowledged this is not a comfortable situation and there has to be a solution. And it also relates to how China would handle Taiwan, right? So they're watching the U.S. response, the European response very carefully. How do you see it, Ian? Well, I, I think uh, there's almost negligible chance of uh, China invading Taiwan. I think that would be economically and politically suicidal. Uh, for China. The reason the Communist Party is so strong, the reason the President Xi is so strong, is because they've doubled incomes every 10 years for the last 40 years. They are the biggest beneficiaries of globalization by far in the world. Right. Uh, they know that they need the world, the world needs them, and they also need the world not just for economic growth and sustaining their growth and incomes, but also to solve the global problems. 
They've been through the pandemic. They know they don't want another pandemic. They are the most vulnerable country in the world to climate change. They need a collective solution to the global problems like everyone else does, but even bigger. And I think they absolutely recognize they, that if they had to invade uh, Taiwan, not they had to, if they did invade uh, Taiwan, uh, that would be the end of the China growth story. Uh, they would be absolutely ostracized. It could also lead to the next world war, of course. So I think there's no logical reason for it, but we know that wars don't happen because of logic. Uh, we know that uh, the USSR shot down a, a US spy plane in 1960, and that was very fundamental to the escalations that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and we nearly had a global world war then by accident. Uh, the leaders had the wisdom to step back. The question now, particularly in the US, where I think the, the politics are very fractious, and the only thing that seems to unite the right and left and the Democrats and Republicans in the US is they, their dislike for China. Um, and so I think we're in a very dangerous situation where the potential for accidents is rising by the day, and that's not where we want to be. So <laughs> this brings the question of what can people do, and particularly what can Europe, what can this region do, what can others do to help de-escalate this uh, and to make sure we don't head there. Well, you, you, this was a, uh, a regional government summit, actually very focused on the UAE, and it's become global in its 10 years and on the 10th year anniversary. But can you hone in on that neutrality that the UAE maintains and tries to serve as an honest broker, but faces east and west, of course, and then into the global south? How would you play it if you're the UAE leadership? It's, it's a tricky game. Uh, a big demand customer for UAE and Saudi crude, Kuwaiti crude, for example, uh, but they obviously hold a lot of assets in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> far be it from me to advise the UAE, but you know, I'm an economist as well. Uh, what, I, what I feel uh, is that the economic center of gravity of the world is right above us today. Uh, it's moved very rapidly from across the Atlantic, the middle, mid-Atlantic, to above us where we are today. It's and amazing. It's, have you, and, have you uh, seen the survey of the London yeah, School of I've, Economics? It's pretty absolutely, amazing. Absolutely. If you haven't and, seen it, it looks uh, at what's happened and, over the last 20 years. And it's years. moving further and further east yeah. because Asia will continue to grow at double or triple the growth rates of North America and Europe. Mm -hmm. This is an inevitability that, that Asia becomes the biggest market, it becomes much bigger than half of world GDP, uh, and that this region and particularly a region which is able to, to engage in trade with all sides, becomes bigger and bigger in its significance in terms of a gateway of all respects, a center of gravity. Uh, that's what history has on the side of this region. And um, of course, that would be deeply frustrated and held back if the world fractures. Hmm. And the worst is if you have to choose. And that's the situation that Europe faces now. Does it have to choose? If, the, if we get into a new Cold War, do countries have to choose which side they are? And that would be terrible for this region. It would be terrible for all developing countries. It would be terrible for countries around the world that don't want to have to choose because they want to be able to benefit from global growth and poverty reduction. So uh, this region has a very strong interest as well in avoiding that. Uh, like many other places do, uh, and certainly, you know, it, it was interesting coming in from the airport last night and seeing ads, adverts for Huawei. Now, in the UK, you don't have those anymore. No. Mm -hmm. Just on that simple one technology, the UK had to, had to choose. Uh, and so that's, that's where you don't want to be. <laughs> uh, in that context, um, in fact, at my course at NYU Abu Dhabi, we're looking at the GCC is a global emerging market hub and the influence of Saudi Arabia, the Abraham Accords, making an energy transition. There's a lot of components there that you talked about, but one of the things at the heart of the UAE government is we are the most globalized economy in the world. We have to breathe off of yeah. globalization. Is, is it fractured and it can't be repaired? Do you believe in regionalization as a safety uh, valve for uh, supply chains? What happens after what we saw in the pandemic? Well, you know, there's a lot of talk about deglobalization. It's mostly hot air at the moment. Uh, if you look at the data on global flows, 
not least between China and the US, it's at record levels, mm. uh, trade flows, and the value of trade at record levels in 2022. Uh, and yes, the, of course the pandemic slowed down and we had that uh, dramatic disruption to globalization, but many flows have recovered, uh, investment flows, digital flows, and physical flows. As economies get richer, you expect a smaller share of the economies to be physical, uh, a bigger, much bigger share to be services, including uh, services which are not in containers, uh, but which are in places like Dubai, uh, in terms of the service provided, legal, financial, technological, and medical, and other. So that's happening. Yes, fragmentation would happen. Asia is not deglobalizing. Brazil used to take a year, 30 years ago, to export $72 billion of goods to Asia. Now it takes one day, hmm. okay? This, Asia is absorbing materials, sharing materials, supplying materials to the rest of the world. So the, if it is going to be fragmentation and deglobalization, it's going to be across the Atlantic. Uh, and that's the irony of history, because that's the region, not least the US and UK, that started this whole thing, that were the agents of globalization, that saw the wisdom of trade as an agent for economic growth. So it's terribly ironical now that we're in a race to the bottom in subsidies, industrial subsidies, which used to be the absolute anathema uh, of the US and of Europe, and particularly of the UK. Yeah, if you would have told me <laughs> Five years ago, we'd have a Brexit. I'd think you're crazy, right? Who divorces themselves from a market of 450 million people at your doorstep? But are we, I did a fireside chat with John Simpson of the BBC, who you know has been covering uh, the world for 50 years. And he says, I see the flickerings of the fact that populism is about to peter out. Uh, do you share that uh, or, or not? No, I, I, I'm very concerned about it. I think there were two drivers for the growth in populism. The one was rising inequality. M when people say in the UK, in the north of the UK, or the Midwest of the US, or the north of France, they do not benefit from globalization. They are not fantasizing. They are worse off, their incomes mm. are lower than they were uh, 30 years ago. Mm. And that relates to the second uh, factor, which is crises. The f if we would not have had Brexit in Britain. We would not have had President Trump in the White House had it not been for the financial crisis. These crises which destroy faith in the ability of people to manage, especially the financial community, who have the best brains, the best money, the best institutions, the IMF, their head is here. These are, the, these are the absolute pinnacle of the international system and the national system, our central banks, our finance ministries, our treasuries, our CEOs of the banks, our audit committees, etc. When that system is discredited, uh, people lose faith. So I think these crises matter. And one of the things that we need to take away, I believe, is if we want to stop populism, we need to address inequality, make sure people feel better from globalization, not worse, and we need to stop systemic risks, financial crises, pandemics, etc. Can we do it? Of course, but that requires cooperation between governments. That's the theme of this conference. Well, it, that's an interesting point because uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about this in the past, but I'd love to have you address it now. The institutions that were built after World War II, right? The United Nations, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, evolving to the World Trade Organization, uh, they don't seem to be fit for the 21st century. And that's part of that disconnect uh, with government and their people. But then if you have a global problem like Russia, people are saying, okay, or the horrible earthquake that we've seen in Turkey and Syria, what's the response? Yep. You know, we need a, almost like a rapid action force, and that doesn't seem the architecture for it anymore. What's the problem here? The system is totally unfit for 21st century purpose. You certainly wouldn't want to uh, have been in Syria relying on the Security Council or in the Ukraine relying on the Security Council to save you. Uh, so, uh, and that's true on all fronts. We saw that the best of the system, and it is the best, which is finance, and I was part of it. I was in, in Washington in the run-up to the financial crisis at the World Bank. Uh, we didn't see it coming. Uh, so, the best of the system is unfit, and that means that there needs to be big. There are lots of reasons for it. One is that we still have the shareholder structure largely that was set in place in 1945. That's one big problem. A second big problem is that the people that are in these institutions are often not are civil servants, basically. They don't really understand the kitchen of international finance. Mm. They didn't know what credit derivatives were in the run-up to the financial crisis. 
because that wasn't their skill set. Uh, so we, we need a WHO that is greatly reformed and empowered to stop the next pandemic. And uh, uh, one would argue, there's a lot of literature on this, is that it's, you know, it was the candidate for China that sits as the, you know, the head of the organization. I'm not saying it's true or not true, but there's a lot written about this and the influence of different global powers, the yes. influence of the United States on the IMF and the World Bank, for example. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... <laughs> The, I used to go around the world when I was at the World Bank telling people about good governance. Well, the US president appoints the head of the World Bank. No competitive process or transparent process at all. Hmm. Uh, who was I to talk about that in that context? So we need a reform which is deep and widespread, but we need to not blame and beat the institutions. One should not beat up on the WHO because it didn't stop the pandemic, or the IMF because it didn't stop the financial crisis. Because we, governments, are the shareholders. It's like beating up on a company that does badly rather than blaming the board hmm. for their decisions. And so we need to, to be, you know, it's the governments of the world that need to fix this problem. You cannot fix the problem from within the institutions. Okay, final point, and this wasn't on our agenda this morning, but we have uh, four minutes. The, the threat of our lifetime is climate change, right? And then we have these different camps, you know, the oil and gas producers who want to be part of the solution and should be under one tent. But we see such division, environmentalists, the development economists, for example, uh, the banks, the energy companies, they're all extremely divided, and as a result, progress in the COP process, the language within uh, the UN community when it comes to climate doesn't relate to this group in the room whatsoever. The consumer has almost no stake in it. Uh, don't you worry that with the US, China, and the Cold War, that we're just not implementing fast yeah. enough? No, I, I, as I mentioned, the, the greatest danger in a Cold War is that everyone's not only unable to cooperate to solve the problem, but distracted and only focusing on, on these issues. Um, and that's, that's the real danger. We're sitting in a room called COP28, yes. um, so it's right that we focus uh, on this. It'll be down the road uh, when, when it happens. Uh, absolutely. I think we're going to see a rapidly rising awareness. Um, we're going to start seeing a greater intensity, frequency of climate-related episodes. Uh, it'll touch everyone's life in the world. And uh, the only question is, uh, like with world wars, like with the Cold War, is do we wake up when it's too late? Or are we wise enough as a species uh, to preempt these risks and stop them? I'm so happy you said that, because I, I become frustrated with daughters, and you kind of think, what's going to be left for them? Why is it that the our species, the human species, cannot plan medium and long term. The Rio Agreement was signed in 1992. We've been kind of you know, arguing for 30 years whether climate change is real or not. And, and, and is, can government be fit for purpose to change that? I think you know, we shouldn't be too gloomy. What the world has achieved in the post-war era is unprecedented in human history. There's been more progress more rapidly than at any time in history over the last 35. That's why the stakes are so high. Right. There's so much to lose. The number of people lifted out of poverty uh, and all sorts of other indicators. Empowerment of women, our knowledge of climate change. All of these things are extraordinary breakthroughs of recent years and there's much more to come. We're at the beginning of this threshold of progressive change. The question really is, and I, I looked at it um, in the context of, of the Second World War, and for, why did the leaders of this, after the Second World War create a whole new world order, domestically and internationally, and they didn't do it after the First World War? And was it just because we were lucky enough to have two great people, Roosevelt and Churchill, or was there something else happening? And my uh, understanding of this in the 58 seconds that remain is, firstly, those people had been through the First World War. Oh. They knew that in this they did things very differently. This was a repeat game. They had literally had the scars. And secondly, it wasn't actually driven by them. It was driven by popular will, the people demand. People would not allow their kids to go off to war and be killed again hmm. unless they believed this really would be the war to end all wars, unlike what H.G. Wells had said in the First World War. 
They wanted something different. And so that's why Churchill, and you can imagine what a war hero Churchill was after he had won this war against impossible odds. He was deposed from office in the biggest landslide Labour's ever seen by an unknown figure, Clem Attlee, that makes the current Labour leader in England seem rather charismatic. Uh, it was because people said they needed change. Hmm. And it's that message for me that comes out of the Second World War that if, you've, if that citizens plus leaders work together to bring change uh, that I think uh, we can take from that. Good, that's a good place to finish. Uh, good to see you. I, I don't like to be dire in the conversation, but it's a pretty challenging, as they say, a polycrisis today. So I'm glad you're willing to address it, but then also look that you can shift away from a Cold War is what you're saying. Yeah, no, we, 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 the worst thing now would be a defeatist view that we, it's inevitable. Uh, I think the onus is on all of us to turn down the rhetoric and to recognize our entangled future. We're codependent uh, and we're not gonna get anywhere uh, by, by raising rhetoric. It's uh, great to see you again and thanks for covering everything in uh, 20 minutes, that's for sure. The world in 20. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks a lot.